I'll continue just to review a little bit what we said last time. So we talked about uh, you know, why string theory has this uh, place at the top of the list of possible candidate theories of quantum gravity and uh, why it doesn't at this point make clear testable predictions that we expect to uh, test. You know, there are many things that we predict which we verify and have no special reason to think will be falsified. So in that philosophical sense, it's a test. But uh, we'd rather have something we, ha we think has more chance of being falsified. And uh, then I talked about the uh, landscape. And uh, my main argument was this one, that it's really a very generic property of uh, physical theories to have a landscape. And uh, it's actually more surprising to claim that a complicated theory doesn't have a landscape when you think about it. And uh, then we spoke about uh, this uh, busso poncheski model. And I'll put up uh, this slide, which uh, illustrated this basic point that uh, the uh, points represent uh, vacua. There are these uh, integer vectors in a high dimensional space. The circle represents this uh, anthropic or otherwise allowed region of possible solutions to the cosmological constant problem. And uh, if you get out just a few dots in a very high dimensional space, it becomes uh, very likely to have dots within that circle, even if it's incredibly thin. So, uh, so it's a fairly uh, <clears throat> simple idea conceptually, and it has been checked in the detailed origin of these uh, flux vacua within uh, string theory. And uh, the uh, best established calculations do come up with this number of the order 10 to the 500, but that's one class of models. There are models that come out of uh, F theory where that number looks more like uh, you know, many thousands in the exponent. There could be other factors that we haven't taken into account that reduce it. So that's not a definite estimate at this point. And in fact, I'll spend a good deal of time talking later about the more basic question of how we know that number is even finite. But uh, it certainly makes the point, and it would solve this uh, cosmological constant problem. And uh, it's interesting if you try to just multiply accuracies to which we know measured independent constants in the standard model, it's uh, this type of uh, number, so this, this sort of ballpark. OK, so uh, I don't want to talk a lot about details of the string landscape. It would obviously be a whole you know, series of, of lectures to describe it in detail. One point I wanted to make was this relation between uh, pictures like uh, this one. So this is stabilizing a modulus. A modulus might be the size of a particular topological cycle in the extra dimensions and uh, the question of uh, fixing coupling constants. So obviously a very deep question in physics. You know, what, what is it that determines the finite structural constant and all these other things? And there's a clear answer to that in the string landscape. And surely there would be in other fundamental theories. It's that uh, the uh, gauge theories arise. They have several different origins. But one which is easy to picture and to use in this argument is to say that there's some sort of a brain that extends through all of the observed four-dimensional space-time, but is localized in the extra dimensions and wraps one of these little bit of these cycles, is uh, you know, you know, identified with it. And then the strings attached to that brain lead to a uh, gauge theory sector. And you can then compute, just from the fact that it's a higher dimensional gauge theory and standard dimensional reduction, that the observed gauge coupling constant is some sort of more fundamental thing, which you know, might be a constant determined in terms of string theory numbers times the volume of that cycle. And so a modulus, which is a volume of a cycle, translates directly into a observed coupling constant. And if you get the details of these relations right in a particular vacuum, you can compute the coupling constants. And uh, where that connects to the previous discussion, of course, is that uh, when I put these uh, points down, of course, there's the implicit claim that it's really a point. And you can't vary the modulus. There's a potential that gives a large mass to that uh, modulus. And uh, for example, in the case of the standard model, I, I said you could compute the known contributions to the vacuum energy function of the fine structure constant. And they would depend in a very non-trivial way. And uh, in string theory, that fine structure constant would be controlled by a modulus. And then you would know, just on general grounds, that uh, in you know, our vacuum, in our, in our universe at the present day, and 
very far into the past, that modulus must be at a local minimum of the potential. And so that's what fixes out of, you know, that, you know, we have these many other choices going to the vacuum, but once we've made those choices, the uh, final structure constant is fixed by being at that local minimum. And in particular, what that means is that the final structure cannot vary with uh, time because it really is controlled by a field that's sitting at a local minimum of a, a potential. And again, there's a piece of a long discussion where you could talk about loopholes and so forth, but uh, certainly at the present time, that's true. So observations of a varying final structure constant would falsify most of what I've said so far, and you know, you know, not the philosophical things I'll say later, but uh, you know, much of much of the discussion. So that's another level of falsifiability. Okay. So again, I don't want to talk about uh, you know, intriguing details not you know, connected to the points I'll make, but just to make the point that uh, we don't have the full definition of string theory at this point, but uh, you know, we certainly have many pieces of it. We think there are definitions to be had. And uh, so then there would be the hope of coming up with some sort of an ab initio way to calculate the properties of these vacuum. Again, a very difficult problem, but one that one could imagine having an answer to, to say that here are the choices, you know, here are the possibilities for the extra dimensions, manifolds that I'll talk about, other stringy objects that we only have a partial understanding of now, the many other things, and we continue to calculate and uh, maybe put it on a computer to get numbers. So we would have this sort of ab initio predictivity in a given vacuum, and then we would really be forced to confront this problem of the vacuum selection or the measure factor. So uh, we've had a lot of success in taking well-posed problems in string theory and uh, eventually solving them. So I think that's a dream at the moment, but, but not a crazy dream. OK, there's another amusing uh, quantitative result. If you start uh, classifying string vacua that look anything like those that contain the standard model, you get numbers like about one in a billion actually match the gauge and matter content of the standard models. That's a typical. Uh, claim coming out of detailed study of the string landscape. And so that's not the hard part of the problem. You know, you know other things are, seem to be harder than that. OK. Uh, this is, again, a point I've made sort of implicitly. So uh, you know, suppose, again, you know, I mean, again, we, as I'll describe in more detail, you can't really classify even extra dimensional spaces in six dimensions. but. Uh, you can get some sort of say, you know, you can say, you know, what are we supposed to classify? What does the structure look like? And uh, it might be something with some sort of uh, beautiful pattern and symmetry, like, uh, you know, like uh, this, right? It might be that there's some sort of, uh, you know, 500-dimensional version of this, you know, which has an obvious uh, structure in it, and that understanding that structure is the key to understanding the landscape. You know, or it might be that, uh, you know, well, you, know, you never see pictures like that in, in, in lectures about chemistry and biology. And uh, the closest you come is that, well, the atom, you know, the shells and the atom do have this uh, very simple structure determined by the representation theory of uh, SO3. But as uh, soon as you move on to molecules, you know, you quickly lose this uh, kind of elegant simplicity and uh, you just get a lot of details, you know, very rich subject but uh, just requires understanding that complexity. And certainly when you read the string theory literature as it is now, it looks much more like this. You know, you're kind of sticking together brains and cycles and these various pieces to reproduce the standard model. And uh, maybe that's just how one has to think about it. So that's a kind of a deep uh, question, which again, you could ask for any, any theory with a landscape. And uh, it's not terribly obvious what the answer is for string theory. Our, our experience in the past has been that we get things like this, but certainly the evidence so far is like this. OK, so now let me turn to these uh, computational and uh, mathematical aspects. OK, so now <clears throat> there's a very precise sense in which you can argue that uh, even if we had this ab initio calculation ability to, to in principle, list the vacua, to calculate the parameters to even calculate the cosmological constant in each single vacuum, you know, so you know, incredible calculational power. You know, then, you know, and you know, and we, you know, we, we test the predictions. We keep the ones which which could fit, and uh, maybe we find, uh, we, hopefully, we find many that actually fit the cosmological constant to within uh, you know observable, observable accuracy. Okay, well, if there's one, then that person we found it, but. 
if the number of vacuous tends to be 500, probably there will be many such things. And uh, what I'm telling you now is that it's intractable in this precise sense of computational complexity theory to find the ones that get this small cosmological constant, you know, and then even more so to sort through some possible list of these guys. And uh, I'll make the argument, I'll outline it, and uh, then there's a lot of sort of interesting potential for, for, I think, bringing these ideas into a cosmology that I'll just be able to hint at. So there's a paper of mine with uh, Frederick Deneff in Annals of Physics from 2006 that I'll refer you to. Okay, so we'll come back to this uh, busel polchinski model. So recall that we have a uh, model for the set of flux vacua where a vacuum is labeled by a vector of integers n in some, you know, let's say 500 dimensional space. We've postulated a symmetric real matrix. We've postulated this negative energy. And the goal is simply to find a vector of integers which uh, makes V very small, you know, 10 to the minus 55 in the units I was saying before, 10 to the minus 120 if the scale is set by the Planck scale, but, you know, a small number. Okay, and so it's very easy to argue statistically that such a thing should exist. But now let's suppose, you know, we, we've you know, really done everything else. We believe strength theory. We want to say, we want to narrow down, you know, what, what are those fluxes of the extra dimensions that actually do it? Okay, so how do we find it? Okay, well, you know, in principle, given the you know, the presumptions is probably the right word that I've uh, stated. We just search through this list. We calculate the V, we try each one, okay? But of course, the problem is that if our argument was uh, statistical, all I told you is that if you look through 10 to the 120 different candidates, you're likely to find one that works. And obviously the problem with that is that it would take a very long time to go through 10 to the 120 candidates, right? So you can you know, estimate what you could do with computers we could build on Earth. You know, maybe you could go through 10 to the 22. You know, they're, they're doing amazing things at Google and Apple and so forth. You know, maybe they can do 10 to the 22. Okay, well, suppose we had a computer for every atom of the Earth. Suppose we could check a candidate every Planck unit of time. Well, then we could get 10 to the 93. So we still fall short. So we're not talking about these uh, numbers that George Ellis taught, spoke about, but we, we still can't get up to 10 to the 120. That brute force search. Okay, well, it doesn't prove you can't do it. You just have to be more clever. Okay, so uh, for example, factoring numbers, the naive approach is just to try everything up to the square root of the number and see if it divides in. But there are much more clever ways to do it. Okay, and then of course, if you just you know, look through the you know, landscape of mathematical problems, then cleverness can get you very far, right? So there will be a naive approach to finding the solutions of the Fermat type of equation up to some n and up to some z max, right? And so you could search through them, but there's no point because uh, Andrew Wiles proved that there aren't any. And uh, you know, so you might imagine proving, in fact, that uh, what I said is, is wrong. You know, there's is not such a vacuum in string theory. Okay, so uh, how can we study this question? And uh, this is really a question of computational complexity theory. We have a well-posed toy problem at this point, but of course you could try to get closer to the string theory problem, and someday we might know the string theory problem. And so we're trying to decide, is there some sort of uh, absolute barrier to uh, coming up with some more clever, some faster way to uh, solve it, to find a vacuum that satisfied that simple condition? And the basic structure of computational complexity theory is to define complexity classes of well-defined families of problems. And so a famous two classes are the class P. So, it, it, you know, again, I'm just, you know, we, we say a lot more in, in terms of the background in, in, our, in our article. We, give, we try to give a good introduction to this for uh, physicists. And uh, so there's the class P where uh, you basically take some measure of the size of the problem. So in the case of the factoring problem, you might take the number of digits as a reasonable measure of the size. And uh, then you say that, well, you can solve the problem, or to be even more precise, because you know, what's a solution? You might have to talk a while about that. Let's just say that there's a yes, no answer that you have to establish. And uh, so uh, let's just, this is not factoring, this is the opposite. You know, one, you know you're given three numbers. You know, there's the one, the product of the other two. Well, that's polynomial in the number of digits, so that's a problem in this class P. Polynomial time in, there's a function of the size of the problem. Okay, so a lot of problems are like that. Okay, so now there's this much bigger class, which is where somebody 
gives you the solution and you can at least check it in polynomial time, but you don't necessarily know that you could have found it in polynomial time. And so I've just argued that, in fact, the uh, factoring problem is in polynomial time in the sense that if somebody gives us the answer, we can check it in P. But nothing I've said so far says it gives us a way to find it, which would be polynomial time in the number of digits. Okay, so uh, at least there's something somebody can tell us that uh, we can check that yes, the answer was yes or no in this uh, polynomial amount of time. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to some discussion of some NP problems, and they come up very generally as well. So, uh, yeah, I give some examples here. Let me do that and come back to the previous slide. Okay, so one of the classic examples in the uh, computer science textbooks, you know, suppose you've got n cities on the map. You're not going to use the map, you're just going to give pairwise distances between the cities. And now you have to propose some tour that goes through each city once and achieves some upper bound on the total length of the tour. So it turns out that for general posing, obviously the size would just be the number of cities. And to solve this, well, it's easy to check if somebody gives you a tour, you know, is, is it short? Well, that, 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 that's very easy. But to find one can be very hard. So what does very hard mean? Well, first of all, you know, it's not known how to do it in polynomial time. But then there's this even stronger sense, which says that all the problems of that nature, so the problems that are in NP can be reduced to the problems that, you know, to the particular problem at hand. Okay, so that's the point that I'm going to try to describe in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the NP hard problem is one that if you could solve it, you could solve any other NP problem in that amount of time. Say if you could solve it in polynomial time, then you know you could solve everything else in polynomial time. Okay. Well, there's this is one that's going to be important to us. Somebody just gives you a list of integers. Is there a subset that adds up to some proposed integer t? I mean, it sounds trivial, but we're allowing large integers. Of course, the size now is going to be the number of digits times the number of integers, but even that one turns out to be uh, NP complete. Okay, and then the SAT is, in some, some say it's the most basic one. So you're given a list of logical, you know, Boolean logical propositions in terms of variables, ors. There's an implicit and that we have to satisfy each of these uh, clauses, and uh, not is the bar. So is there an assignment of truth values to the variables that makes all of these true? So that's the SAT problem, and that is NP complete. Well, you know, all of them have some sort of something exponential in them, right? Here you could just try all assignments of variables and just check, is there one that works? But given n variables, there's two to the n possible truth tables. So that's clearly an exponential algorithm. But if somebody gives you the right one, you can check it fairly quickly. OK, so now nobody's proven. Of course, there's this famous problem. You know, Could there be a way to solve one of these problems in polynomial time? And nobody's proven there hasn't. What they've proven and it's not that hard to prove, is that if you can solve one of those problems in polynomial time, you can solve all the other ones. Okay, and then that SAT problem, of course, you can cut a lot of things into logic in principle. I mean, this is this crazy argument, but the computer scientists all make it. Okay, let's just take the Riemann hypothesis, and uh, you work out the, uh, you know, basically the elementary real analysis that constructs real numbers, you know, as logical statements, and you boil it down to logical expressions, feed it to the SAT solver, and uh, you know, find out. You know, I mean, uh, of course, it might be polynomial long, but that's different from exponential time. Okay, so not only you know, according, you know, you have this Clay Prize. Not only do you get a million dollars for solving this problem, but if the solution is that they're equal, maybe you can solve other problems. So the computer scientists will tell you that this is in fact the most important problem on the list. Although almost all of them believe that these are not equal and that we will not gain this uh, super human ability. OK, so how do you prove that a problem is NP-complete? And uh, the concept is uh, simple. Basically, you need to be able to encode some known NP-complete problem. So let's take the SAT. We'll grant for the moment that the SAT problem is NP-complete. And uh, so the claim is that uh, if somebody hands you a SAT problem, a big list of clauses, and you can translate it into your problem, solve your problem, and then translate that back into a solution of SAT, well, then you can solve SAT 
in polynomial time, if you can solve in polynomial time, and then you could use the statement for SAT, the analogous thing to solve everything else in polynomial time. So that's the idea of reduction, and that's the sort of the basic theoretical concept in this part of computer science, that you're reducing SAT to your problem to show that your problem is MP-complete. And of course, you would have to be able to do all that, only granting the polynomial number of operations. OK, so, so that's the idea. And I'll even at least flash uh, some things about that idea shortly. And uh, then how do you do it for SAT? Well, you know, the, the, we're talking about computer science after all. All these things are things you could program on a computer. So if you could take the process of just running the computer program, so what was the definition of NP? You know, there's, there's some program that verifies your solution in a polynomial time. You take the definition of a program, say, you know, a program for a Turing machine, and then you translate that into a SAT problem, okay? And that's, again, a, a, you know, a story, but, you know, not, not a, you know, not a deep story, just a detailed story of translating the problem, the computer program, into this list of logical statements. And then if you can verify a set of logical statements in polynomial time, then you could verify that any program Again, this is not solving things like holding problems. This is you know, solving problems that uh, naively would take exponential time faster. Right, these are all for any given problem. You know, every given problem is finite. And uh, so we know that, you know, that the thing will, the, will run in finite time. There's a different, obviously, branch of mathematics that deals with potentially infinite things and undecidability. So there's a, you know, a literature of this sort of thing. A lot of this work was done in the uh, 70s, was when this concept originated. But people still do prove that things, new, new problems are NP-complete. And uh, so just to, you know, again, outline, some subset sum is one that uh, is relevant for us. Because we, what we did in our work was to argue that Buso polchinski is it's effectively a special case of subset sum, this problem of solving the cosmological, finding a vacuum that solves the cosmological constant problem in Buso polchinski So you could use the reduction proof from subset sum and adapt it to this case. And the way you do things for a subset sum is, uh, again, a little intricate. Basically, you take all these logical clauses and you talk about very long numbers where you have a digit for each variable and you encode all these variables into digits and you all encode all of your logical clauses into statements about particular numbers having to add up to the target number. And uh, without going into detail, you, know, you, could, you can write down explicit expressions so that take a particular SAT problem and give you a particular set of integers where you've uh, you know, chosen the digits according to a, you know, a direct translation of your logical statement. So, uh, OK, so again, I refer you to the review if you want to, uh, to <coughs> see any details. But uh, the concept, I hope, is uh, clear. And uh, so then, again, in our, in our paper, we, as I said, you know, for, for present purposes, I think it suffices. We show that this problem of buso polchinski which, uh, you know, as you recall, sum of some you know, matrix times ni squared. And in fact, we could just use a diagonal matrix. So the claim is, can you, can you find a way to do it for any proposed problem of this type, OK, and for arbitrarily large flux? OK, so, so, so I'll come back to the relation of that to string theory. But that's this general buso polchinski problem. If somebody just handed you a landscape of that sort, could you find the vacuum with the small cosmological constant? And it's a question of finding numbers that squared add up to very precisely this you know, V0, the, you know, almost cancel this postulated minus V0 term. Yeah, yeah, that, see, we, we'd only like to be able to talk about uh, the solutions where n is 0 or 1, right? So in the subset sum problem, as I defined it, you take a subset. So you're taking a combination of integers where the weights n are either 0 or 1. That defines a subset. And of course, in our lusso polchinski problem, we sum squares of flexes, you know, ni squared, right? So that doesn't have to be 0 or 1. That could be 4 or 9 or something. But you can get around that by, uh, you know, technical device. OK. So, so in that sense, this, this, this class of problems that includes Busso polchinski again, if you had to solve the broad class of problems, would be NP-complete. OK. And so there would be not a proof that you could not find or even argue, you know, you know show that such a vacuum exists. But, uh, you know, the, the claim that, you know, if, if you could do it for that problem, 
you could do it for this vast array of other NP complete problems. And uh, then, of course, string theory, we presumably are talking about a particular version of those problems. There's you know, some list of extra dimensional spaces, some correct matrix to stick into this model. So it's not in itself the answer to our question, you know, can you do it for all possible models? There are particular ones that will come out of string theory. And so that leads to the possibility that, well, maybe there's something special about string theory that helps you. But uh, again, the experience with this kind of problem is, 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 is no. You know, it won't, you know, once you're in this range of problems, then they are, for all intents and purposes, intractable. You know, this, this type of naive solution it's hard to do much better than that. Okay? And so, uh, of course, you know, in, in, in many ways, I put up a straw man. Right? We do not need to find, if, if, if in particular, this choice of fluxes in the extra dimensions doesn't correlate to the other testable aspects of our vacuum, then, of course, we might not care about this. You know, that would certainly be the uh, pragmatic physicist approach. But uh, as certainly a philosophical claim, the claim that we could you know, believe, you know, have you know, establish string theory to, you know, anybody's satisfaction, you know, some hypothetical future discoveries do this, but we can never know, we can never find the vacuum that did it, right? That, that does seem intriguing. Okay, and then this, I think, does potentially lead to a new way of thinking about uh, cosmological selection. Now, I, Denneth and I advertised a paper where we tried to think about this, and it was so confusing we did not publish it, but uh, one of these days we may come back to it, okay? So, Given that it's so hard, okay, there's this, uh, you know, again, precise result telling us that it's really hard to find these, these vacuous small cosmological constants. So how did our universe do it? And, uh, well, you know, obviously, if it's anthropic selection, you just postulate a multiverse, many, many different regions that try the different things out. So you have an immense parallel computer. There's no problem postulating 10 to the 120 or 10 to the 500 different computing units, these different universes that are doing it. And uh, so that's a valid answer if you postulate that vast structure of the uh, multiverse. Okay, but could there be other ways to do it, right? I mean, this again, we, we can, we'll accept this one. Might there be some other way that within the landscape physical theory could find it? And in fact, it's a very common suggestion. For example, Scott Aronson, but you know, Feynman and many others have proposed that. Uh, no physical process can solve a general NP hard problem, okay, in which case there would be no other way to do it. And uh, then one can reason about this using this computational complexity theory. Again, all, all I'm going to do is uh, point you to our paper in an interesting realm of discussion. And so, in fact, there is a computational complexity class that corresponds to quantum computing with the anthropic uh, ability. The anthropic ability is basically to say, you start your computer, you run it, it can produce three things. It can say yes, you know, is the answer. It can say no is the answer. Or it can say self-destruct, you know, we don't exist anymore. And you start off a bunch of these in your parallel universes. And uh, then as long as you live in a universe where it finds the answer, you count the problem as solved. And uh, that's the class uh, post BQP, if that's a quantum computer. And in fact, you, Aronson showed that that was equivalent to a much simpler class that you could define. So there are non trivial relations between these classes. And this one's far larger than NP. So that's the, you know, that's, that's in some sense the theoretical justification of this you know, kind of obvious claim. And there's a lot of other very interesting things. I, again, I could give a whole talk on this. I just want to introduce it. Okay, so suppose, you know, Tony and the others work hard and give us a measure principle, okay? And we, you know, they work through, and you know, this was proposed in the past. I don't think they would advocate it now, but suppose in the end of the day, it turns out we have to find the vacuum with the minimum positive cosmological constant, right? So there's just this finite list of vacua. We throw out all the ones with zero and minus. We're looking for the one with the, mini the, the minimum lambda. Of course, I'm, I'm sure that was must, much discussed here in, in old days. If you measure factor was you know, e to the constant over lambda, that's what you would get. You would overwhelmingly favor that. Okay, so now you can ask, uh, how hard is it to find the vacuum with the minimum positive cosmological constant? Okay, so now, well, this is this is even harder. You know, before we were just talking about one finding a very small cosmological constant, but now we have to prove that it's smaller than all the other ones. Okay, so that is a harder, and in fact, in a 
the more difficult, larger computational class. Okay, so it's called DP in the sense that it has this NP component. First of all, you define the small ones, and then you have to prove that they are, you know, the one that you're interested in is smaller than all the others. That is, you can already show it's in co-NP. You know, the complement of that problem is an NP, and then it's in the conjunction of NP and co-NP DP. So it's a strictly harder problem. And in fact, uh, you know, this would really be hopeless. You know, if, if this were the answer from the measure factor, we, we might as well all go home, and we'll never find that vacuum. Okay, so so let me uh, switch a bit to another of these uh, mathematical aspects. And uh, again, implicit, uh, I think it was mentioned in the audience, but important uh, fact in the discussion is that the number of string vacuum we're interested in actually is finite, right? So I gave you this, you know, 10 to the 500, but again, that was, you know, simplified models, particular classes of things. We don't know all the ways of calculating a string theory. You know, how do we know? You know so, uh, well, actually, the, the number really is infinite if you allow the size of the extra dimensions to go off to infinity. It's very easy to see that. You look at things like ADS5 cross S5, and you allow more and more fluxes. But what is wrong there, obviously, is that once the extra dimensions get big, then that's not quasi-realistic anymore. We know we can't see the extra dimensions. So we've at least put in that. You know, you might have to put in more conditions, but we've at least put in that it's effectively four-dimensional. And uh, I, you know, certainly, would agree with George Ellis and many others have made the point that you'd, you, know, you, you would compound the problems discussed in uh, Tony's talk if you had to select from an infinite set of possibilities, not just having this infinite number of re universes realizing the possibilities, but having to select out of an infinite set of possibilities would be a double disaster. Okay, so we'd like to know that this is finite and we'd like uh, general arguments for that. And I have a paper with uh, Bobby Acharya that outlines this topic. And uh, so one of the most interesting ones, because it's a you know, very intuitive but relatively hard to think about part of the problem, is the choice of the topology of the extra dimensions. Okay? And uh, so again, again, we don't know how to formulate string theory, but we can ask, suppose it were Kaluza Klein reduction of supergravity. That's a well-posed mathematical problem. You know, what can we say about the possible topologies? Okay, you know, can we list the topologies in six or seven dimensions? So it, it, I'm, I'm glad that uh, George Ellis gave us the basic background with these examples in three dimensions, and the situation in higher dimensions is more complicated, but at least has the same kind of flavor. Okay, so we saw this picture of a k, you know, positive, zero, negative, and so forth, and that turns out to be the foundation of the mathematical discussion. Okay, so. Uh, you can talk about manifolds with a positive Ricci curvature like the sphere. You can talk about things which have zero or perhaps some positive, some zero eigenvalues, but at least non-negative, so like the torus, these Calabiao manifolds, the G2 manifolds. And uh, then you can move on to allowing negative hyperbolic. And uh, this you can pretty much you know, solve. This is hard, people don't really know whether there's a finite number of quality eyes, but at least this is worth talking about. This is unclassifiable, and this is really you know, much, much more complicated. Okay, so let's come back to positive curvature. Well, already in three, there were an infinite number of possibilities, and uh, I've written on my slide the possibility of quotienting by a single, you know, SU2 acting on one side. As, as George mentioned, it's, you can, in fact, quotient by SO4, which is uh, acting on both sides. And these will all, if they're freely acting, lead to distinct uh, positively curved manifolds, and there's clearly an infinite number. You can just look at S3 mod Zn action. And uh, you know, similar things happen in higher dimensions. OK, so there's an infinite series of manifolds. So can we use them to produce an infinite series of string vacua? And you can show very generally, and just in supergravity, you can show from the equations that uh, although as you increase n, intuitively the volume would decrease. You divide the volume of S3 by a factor of n. If you try to use it as a compactification, then the volume actually grows with n. And the point is that you have to turn on flux because it's positive. And, you know, positive curvature, so you have to balance that in the Einstein equation against a, a positive source of energy, so that's the flux. So when you turn on this flux, the quantization condition tells you that as a manifold gets smaller, the flux energy grows. Okay, and if you balance these things, and it's a two-line calculation, which I won't give, you see that, in fact, at the end of the day, having balanced the flux energy against the curvature, the volume actually grows within. 
Okay, so out of this infinite list, if our definition of quasi-realistic is, let's say, the, you know, the size of the extra dimensions is up to you know, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters or up to 100 microns or something, only a finite number can pass that test, just on this very general graph. Okay, so that's the positive curvature case, and it involves this flux. Okay, what about the uh, zero curvature case? Well, these have moduli, so you have to first make this discussion that I at least alluded to in the previous uh, you know, part of the talk about uh, turning on fluxes to stabilize those moduli and get discrete sets. Okay, but now suppose some mathematician comes and proves to us that there's an infinite number of uh, topologically distinct Claudio manifolds. And all this is not the, uh, the majority opinion. There are definitely people, if you, if you go to uh, Miles Reed at uh, Warwick, he will, he will insist to you that there should be an infinite number of topologically distinct Claudio six manifolds. Okay, but there is a remarkable theorem due to a mathematician named Cheeger, which I quote, that tells us that very, on very general grounds, out of that infinite list, all but a finite number will have, again, too large a size if you try to use them and will not form quasi-realistic compactifications. Okay, so you basically put on, again, we're working in the limit where we can think in terms of supergravity so that we have a well-posed mathematical problem. The curvature can't be too big. That's so that we know we can use general relativity and supergravity. The volume can't be too small. That's, uh, well, you know, same reason. And finally, we insist that the diameter, the maximum distance between a pair of points in the extra dimensions is bounded above. And then Chigo proved back in 1970 that the list of manifolds, you know, any list of manifolds satisfying these three conditions can only contain a finite number of diffeomorphism types, so distinct topologies in this smooth sense. And the diameter, of course, is what directly controls the scale at which the theory goes from looking effectively four-dimensional dimensions we see to looking effectively five-dimensional, this dimension that we don't immediately see. But as soon as you get down to the scale of the diameter, gravity will cross over from the uh, inverse square to the inverse cube set. So you will certainly see it. And so that the fact that we do not see that around 100 microns give us the empirical upper bound. If we can plug into this theorem and say that, well, yes, we don't care, at least in this abstract discussion, if there's an infinite number of Calabi Owls, all but a finite number will not agree with observation. OK, so this is a, a little bit more technical. I think I'll skip it. This is about the negative curvature case. And uh, there's this claim, which uh, you can look at a paper I wrote with Renati Kalash that just basically gives you reasons to think it's very hard to use negative curvature, which is good because that part of the classification is so much more complicated and difficult. So uh, now I'm going to just cross over to a few more personal opinions about where this, this might go. And although we certainly have not, you know, not only classified, but not even, you know, not even mapped out the possibilities, and people try to come up with new possibilities, but that activity I won't say it's been petering out, but, but certainly it, it, what's much more common is that you know, the new possibilities don't work or are equivalent to something we knew about or special cases. And I, I think we, we sort of have the possible solutions that we should study to make up the uh, string landscape. There's you know, you know, a big, a big well, yeah, again, you know, technical discussion, all, all the loopholes. This will be a very contentious statement in a string theory meeting, but let me just throw it out here. And, uh, one nice thing about that is then you can start to make intuitive pictures of the possibilities, you know, and, you know, picturing, you know, cycles and brains and things in six dimensions, you know, may not be very easy to visualize, but, you know, again, that's the sort of thing mathematicians do. At least you can come up with ways of thinking about that. And it is kind of, to the extent that there's really some sort of objects moving around, you know, maybe in a topologically non-trivial space, but objects moving around some relatively concrete way, that's something that we could try to uh, think about more intuitively and get some intuitive picture of the possibilities to think about. And a word that I like for this, because it doesn't seem to have been used for anything real, is uh, hyperchemistry, to say that we know this idea of hyperspace, a very old word for extra dimensional spaces and perhaps the extra dimensions. And now we're talking about this complicated picture of putting together brains and cycles and objects to get the standard model and possible extensions of the standard model. And so there's some sort of a hyperchemistry that governs that, that we need to uh, work out simple models up to, to, to think about this. 
OK, so let me briefly conclude, as I said, you know, where, where might this go? Nobody knows where this might go. But uh, that picture that I described has been around for you know, 10 years. And uh, there's not any clear proposal. You know, certainly not proposals that might change it. There's not any clear proposal that might change it. So uh, you know, in, in some ways, it's, 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 it's discouraging. In some ways, it, it, it offers hope. Uh, well, obviously, the main hope for change was that uh, we would discover super partners or other particles at LHC that wouldn't directly speak to the things I said. I didn't use any details of standard model supersymmetry, but it would certainly change the story in, some, in a dramatic way. Once you see supersymmetry, these problems of connecting to the string theory structure not only are far better motivated, they, they, they have so much more structure in them. You know, there's a lot of papers that uh, tried to make specific predictions based on specific models of the extra dimensions and the like. So that, 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 that's a very <coughs> real possibility in the next run and starting in three years. Uh, well, of course, suppose they don't see anything at LHC. The uh, plan at present is to build a linear collider that would produce copious numbers of Higgs bosons, probably in Japan, because they have a large amount of uh, stimulus money that they would like to spend. And uh, as was done at uh, CERN for many years at LEP, you could measure the subtle you know, the, the precise properties of the Higgs boson and try to find subtle deviations from the standard model. And that taught us something, but it was, it was very frustrating. This is the period of more or less all of my career as a physicist, watching, you know, the, the subtle precision measurements from CERN and the like. And they give you hints about physics beyond the standard model, but basically they give you hints. They, you know, you might decide from that that, yes, there's, there's something beyond the standard model, but, you know, we will not know what it is. And, uh, the possible one from cosmology, obviously, is much more relevant to the string theorist. If, again, you see something different than the most simple single field models might lead you to think. OK, I, I made the point explicitly that uh, some of the assumptions in the picture, such as dark energy as cosmological constant, coupling constants are fixed in time, really are foundational and crucial to this picture. And if one really found evidence against, that would falsify the things I'm saying. And uh, then I'll leave with this discussion of the possible theoretical input. And obviously, that's the thing which will keep going and that could lead us to uh, a major revision of the picture in principle. And I think that would come from this project of formal physics, just continuing to sort through the list of different theories and extra dimensions. This 2 0 theory in six dimensions is a very mysterious one. Perhaps if we understood that, we would know a lot more. Perhaps we could prove that other candidate gravities don't exist, or perhaps we would get some place, a more convincing place to look for one. And uh, then finally, granting that the picture I've described stays around, well, I, at this point, I think we need this measure factor. And, you know, again, I'll refer you to a, a paper of mine from about a year ago reviewing this uh, sort of thing. And uh, that, that could someday lead to real predictions after a lot of work. So I think that this is a well-motivated, but a long-term project to go that route. So I'll stop there.